Hazel Rose Hess was born on April 27, 1938. In 1994, 56-year-old Hazel was living in an apartment in Moberly, Missouri, and had six adult children. She also worked at a local restaurant called Tracks End with her daughter, Angela Smith. They worked opposite shifts so that one was always home to take care of her two grandchildren. On the night of June 30, 1994, Hazel would strangely go missing. She was last seen at 10.30 p.m. by Angela and her sister, Victoria. The following day, when Angela came by at 7.30 a.m. for breakfast, she found her mother's brown Chevy Cavalier in the driveway and the door ajar, but her mother was nowhere to be found. She also found it strange that Hazel's sheets and comforter were missing, but all her other belongings were still inside the home. There was also a small amount of blood found inside the apartment bedroom that suggested possible foul play. Before Hazel disappeared, she had voiced concerns about her neighbors, 22-year-old Larry Hayes and 26-year-old Mary Pegalo, who she believed were using drugs and engaging in illegal activities. However, she never reported her concerns to the police. On January 13, 1996, Officer Shelley Jones was called to the grocery store Jervis to arrest a woman who was trying to forge a stolen business check. When she arrived, the suspect was Mary Pegalo. After taking her into custody, she began escorting her to her patrol car when Hayes shot her from two to three feet away with a shotgun. She was even able to fire two shots off, one of which hit Hayes in the leg. After the shooting, Hayes and Pegalo fled the scene and went on the run. When the shots were fired, shoppers inside the store, fearing for their lives, began running for the rear entrance. On February 4th, acting on a tip, Las Vegas police went to the Naughty Pine Motel, where they found Hayes and Pegalo and took them into custody. Since Hayes still had a bullet wound in his leg, he was immediately taken to the hospital. Once out, they were both extradited back to Missouri. While in Vegas, the couple spent all their money in a nearby casino, so Pegalo was forced to find a job. She was hired at a nearby fast food restaurant and was scheduled to start on the day they were arrested. For the shooting, Hayes was given life in prison. Pegalo, on the other hand, was charged with escape from custody. I was not able to find the outcome of her case. As for Angela, she lost her job at the restaurant after missing her shift while trying to sort out the details of her mother's disappearance. It wasn't helped that she was looked at as a potential suspect. Unfortunately, as of 2024, Hazel has not been found, and this case remains unsolved. Heather Nicole Kalorn was born on March 9, 1987, to Christine Kalorn. In 1999, 12-year-old Heather was a student at Blow Middle School living in Richmond Heights, Missouri. In early July, Heather moved in with her mother's friends, Dana Madden and Christopher Herbert, who went by Chris, to help babysit their two-month-old daughter. About a week after moving in, on July 15, 1999, Heather strangely went missing in the middle of the night. At the time, Dana was at her job at 7-Eleven, and Chris was allegedly at a party. While they were gone, a neighbor out walking their dog saw an unknown man leave the apartment around 2 a.m. with a girl Heather's age wrapped in a comforter. When Chris arrived at 4 a.m., he found his two-month-old daughter alone and crying. However, Heather was nowhere to be found. He called Dana, who called the police. When investigators arrived, they noted that people at the scene were acting odd and wouldn't make eye contact. Those same people also didn't want to participate in an interview and tried to leave, but officers wouldn't let them. I'm unsure if they were referring to Dana and Chris. It was discovered that a white comforter with a floral design was missing from the apartment. However, it was the blood that really caught investigators' attention. They described the scene as brutal and said there was blood on the couch, a wash rag, and some pillows that were stuffed in a trash can. When the blood was tested, it linked to Heather. Sadly, after that night, she was never heard from again. It turns out that Chris and his neighbor, Mike Mason, were running a meth lab inside the apartment's basement garage. The two had also sold drugs together in the past. It's theorized that Heather may have witnessed the illegal drug activity and was murdered as a result. 
However, Mike said she was well aware of the drugs being sold. When investigators interviewed Chris, he strangely gave conflicting stories about his location that night. As for Mike, he said that his tow chains were stolen out of his truck that night. It's speculated that Heather was murdered and the chains were used to weigh her down in the nearby Mississippi River. Did someone stop by the apartment that night? Did Heather let them in? Did they sexually assault and beat her up and that's why there was blood on the couch, rag, and pillow? Did they murder her because they didn't want to get in trouble for this sexual assault? Was Chris or Mike responsible or maybe they knew that someone was coming by that night? When they realized Heather was gone, did they know immediately who did it but were afraid to write the person out? In 2004, Chris was arrested on federal drug charges and sentenced to four years in prison. In 2005, Mike was arrested for the same charge and sentenced to six years in prison. A few months later, in April of 2000, Heather's mom, Christine, feeling that Dana knew more than she was telling, decided to confront her at the 7-Eleven where she worked. This led to a verbal altercation and the cops were called. When officers arrived, Christine was arrested after refusing to leave the store. Sadly, Christine died in 2017 at the age of 52 without ever finding out what happened to her daughter. In 2023, investigators said they were following a very promising lead in the case, but wouldn't elaborate further. The good news is they have DNA, and it is being retested with new technology, so there could be a break in the case very soon. But as of 2024, Heather has not been found, and this case remains unsolved. In 1982, 52-year-old Jack Langeneckert was a real estate agent living in Florissant, Missouri. On March 9, 1982, Jack left home, telling his wife that he was heading to show a home. After leaving, he was never seen alive again. A week after his disappearance, his car was found abandoned at the St. Louis Lambert International Airport, but there was no sign of Jack. They also found no indications that he purchased a plane ticket. Strangely, when he disappeared, so did thousands of dollars in stocks and bonds and all the money from his mother's bank account. When Jack's wife and mother found out about the missing money, they were livid because they believed he had taken all the money, left town, and abandoned them. Two years would go by with no signs of him until June 11, 1984, when a farmer in Troy, Missouri, found his skeletal remains. The remains were located in a well house on the Flynn Farm off Highway F, and they determined that he was shot to death execution style. Unfortunately, due to the decomposition, his remains weren't identified until 2023. His family was happy that he was finally identified and by the fact that he hadn't left the state as they originally thought. So who murdered him and why? Well, interestingly, in 1979, Jack, along with some of his associates, had borrowed $25,000 from the Commerce Bank in Fenton, Missouri. The loan was for some restaurant equipment, with the equipment itself being used as collateral. However, some of the signatures were obtained fraudulently, and the money was never paid back. So, the Commerce Bank filed a lawsuit in December of 1980 to collect on the loan. Jack, along with his associates Bart and Paul Howergy, were named in the lawsuit. All three of them owned BPJ Enterprises and were associated with or also owned the Lamelli Real Estate Company. I'm assuming this was the real estate company where Jack worked and managed. Jack and his associates argued that someone else took the money and spent it on items other than restaurant equipment and that Commerce Bank should be held responsible since they allowed it. From what I read, the court disagreed. The day after Jack disappeared, on March 10, 1982, the motion for summary judgment was granted. This means the judge can make a final decision to resolve the lawsuit before it goes to trial. The case was appealed, but the appeals court didn't respond until October 18, 1983. Were they in business with the wrong people and Jack was blamed for the money going missing? Did he take all the stocks and bonds and his mother's money to pay someone back, or was he attempting to flee the country? Unfortunately, as of 2024, we still don't have these answers, and this case remains unsolved.
Catherine Seafelt was born on November 7, 1989, and went by Katie. In 2002, 12-year-old Katie was a 7th grader at Osage Trail Middle School, living in Independence, Missouri, with her mother, Sholly, and twin brother, Cody. On Saturday, October 12th, Katie and her mom got into an argument after Sholly refused to let her go to the party and grounded her. They then spent the evening watching a movie together. After the movie was over, Katie asked if she could watch it again, and Sholly said that was fine and went off to bed. At 1 a.m., someone called the home and Katie answered. Sholly overheard her daughter tell the caller that she was not allowed to have calls that late and to stop calling. When Sholly woke up the next morning, she realized Katie was gone along with her new school clothes. She figured Katie had run away just as she had done in the past and assumed she would show up for school tomorrow. Unfortunately, that never happened. By Monday, October 14th, when there was still no sign of Katie, Sholly reported her missing, but unfortunately, the police didn't take the case seriously due to Katie's history of running away. Years would go by before law enforcement and the media gave the case any attention. Her family feels that the call that came in on the night of the 12th must have had something to do with her disappearance, but they didn't have caller ID and investigators never traced the call. A few months before she disappeared, she ran away to Buckner, Missouri, which is about 20 minutes from Independence. When her mother found her and picked her up, they got into another argument. This time, Katie gave her mother a dire warning. She said that the next time she ran away, they would never find her. Rumors began spreading around town that Katie was alive and involved in the area's prostitution and drug trade. Sholly decided to check it out for herself and went undercover, but unbeknownst to her, there was a sting operation going on and she was arrested. Sholly believes her daughter was four to five months pregnant and believes she ran away to prevent her from discovering the pregnancy at the doctor's appointment that was scheduled for Monday, October 14th, two days after she disappeared. However, a close friend of Katie's said she never talked about being pregnant. She did say, however, that Katie was hanging around with an 18-year-old man as well as other shady people when she was only 12. One theory is that whoever got her pregnant murdered her to cover up the potential crime associated with Katie being a minor. Some of the names and numbers of the shady people she was hanging around with were given to investigators, but nothing ever came of it. As time went on, investigators began to change their minds about her being a runaway and now feel that she met with foul play. In 2011, they received a tip from a source they deemed very credible that led them to a private farm on North Coger Road in Fort Osage Township, Missouri. The farm was searched, but no remains or clues to her whereabouts were found. Unfortunately, as of 2024, Katie has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Andre Montez Rowland was born in Columbia, Missouri on November 16, 1974. He lived with his mother, whom everyone called Miss Norma, and his seven siblings. In early 1989, 14-year-old Andre was a seventh grader at Jefferson Junior High School who was very popular and intelligent and excelled at sports. He was also known for his easygoing personality and was said to be friends with just about everyone. On the afternoon of March 24, 1989, Andre came home and planned to play basketball at a court down the street. The planned game was for the young men of his church to play against some of the older men, and he had been super excited about it. He wasn't going to leave until closer to the start of the game, but his younger brother talked him into going for a walk. However, his brother wasn't ready yet, so Andre went ahead and said he would take his time so he could catch up. Unfortunately, after leaving the house, Andre was never seen alive again. At 5.30 p.m., an off-duty firefighter sadly found Andre hanging from a tree in a kneeling position similar to someone praying. However, these details are still up for debate. Some reports say that he was found by a neighbor walking his dog and that he was not in a kneeling position but high enough in the tree that he was on his tiptoes. Strangely, there was unexplained blood found on the front of his shirt, and blood was found on some leaves on a hill overlooking the spot where Andre was found. 
At that point, Norma requested an autopsy, and the medical examiner ruled that he had taken his own life and found no marks on the body and no signs of a struggle. As for the unexplained blood, the medical examiner said that victims of strangulation can bleed from the nose and mouth. However, Norma claims that when she viewed her son's body, she found no residue of blood on his mouth or nose. Plus, a belt was used, but Norma said her son never wore a belt. So, if he took his own life, where did he get the belt? Things got even worse after a meeting on April 4th, 10 days after Andre's death, where people met at Progressive Missionary Baptist Church to have petitions signed to have a grand jury investigation. Afterward, Norma says she received threatening phone calls, saying if they didn't stop causing trouble, somebody else would die. Unfortunately, this case also had false rumors that were spread, such as the words KKK being carved on his chest, but that was not true. Andre's family, even to this day, disagrees with the ruling, especially considering that the family was being harassed after moving into the Clearview subdivision. Norma said that unknown individuals had thrown trash into her front yard and vandalized the fence around her property and her mailbox. If Andre was murdered, what was the motive? His family has an idea. They said that Andre was in a relationship with a white female student at school and had been threatened right before his untimely death. The FBI was eventually brought in and agreed with the medical examiner's ruling. As of 2024, Andre's family is still seeking answers. <laughs>